are your people, Lord, and we have come to give praise to you. We have gathered also to give witness to your convictions that reform and renewal must come from the whole church, from the people of God inspired by the Spirit. We have come together to give support to one another in our time of pain. We are leaving an environment in the church which we have had for many years. We are leaving an environment of monarchy, and uh, we are leaving the king-subject relationship that was very, very helpful for an immigrant church, was very helpful for illiterate people that came to the United States at the turn of the century and who wanted to be guided and who did not want to ask questions. We do intend to use our voices and our talents as laymen in full support of the efforts of individuals, priests or laymen, and of groups, civil or church, public or private, who are working to bring Christ into the modern world. I'm Sister Florence Joanne O'Brien from St. Francis Xavier Parish, and I don't consider myself a clergy. I'm a layperson. The church must find new and more effective means because it is a matter of history that we're, even though the church remains the same, she can change her methods. There are parts of her structure that she can change and that evidently she must change in order to meet the challenges of this era. We are all in this together, pope, bishops, clergy, religious, and laity, or we are not in it at all. We need each other. We are members of the same community. We are one in Christ. We are joined by him or we shall be torn apart by him. I think one of the biggest things that has to change is the idea that religion proceeds from the Pope down through the bishops to the people. Religion, if, if it is to be all relevant, must begin with the people and move from there to the Pope. I have some friends that uh, have kind of drifted away from the church, and since talking to them and telling them, explaining them, you know, the new ways of Catholic Church, they've come back to see what it was like and have gotten to like it a lot better. I like it this way. It, I like the change now. I feel happier. You know. I mean, this is a modern day and age. And I think the church has a right to change. The changes that are coming in are, um, are going to help the church very much. I think they're inspired, and I think they're going to help the people to be better Catholics. Well, I'm going to be a Catholic, whatever it will be to me. You know, I'm not really too worried what people say it is. I'm more worried what I think it is and what I make it. In discussing the current changes within the Catholic Church and within the churches generally, I think it's safe to say that one of the big occasions, probably the principal occasion for changes in the church today, has been the convoking and the discussions resulting from the Second Vatican Council convoked by Pope John XXIII. I would say that John is the occasion within the Catholic Church, not the cause, but the occasion for focusing the attention of the Church and the attention of the world on the necessity for change within the Church. John himself, in convoking the Second Vatican Council, was in fact responding to the need for changes within the Church as its rightful or legitimate response to the changes going on within society today. The Church is, by definition, a conservative agency in society, particularly the Catholic Church, which takes its origin from divine revelation, which has the teachings of Christ as the given substance of the faith. However, in order to keep faith with the teachings of Christ, the spokesman for the Church must be certain that their mode 
of presenting Christ to the world or their stance or their posture at any given time is faithful to Christ and is also in tune with the needs of the persons of that day who are receiving the message. Now this is a very complex phenomenon and it, it can't, one can't do justice to it, uh, any one speaker or any one thesis, but just to try to talk about it. The Second Vatican Council in its constitution on the church in the modern world raises the question of secularity, the secular world, its value, its problems, its identity. And that document calls churchmen, priests, religious, and all Catholic laymen to re-examine the needs of mankind in the real situation. The question of civil rights, the question of nuclear warfare, the morality of war, uh, conscientious objection, uh, poverty, uh, wealth, the haves, the have-nots. This document raises many questions for the church, which are not ecclesiastical questions, and in effect bids churchmen and those who claim to be spokesmen for Christ in the modern world to concern themselves with those areas in which humanity is hurting or humanity is bleeding. And this is a difficult period. It's a time that's trying the whole church, and it's, it's trying all of the different authentic spokesmen within the church for conserving the substantial tradition of the church at the same time that the church changes its style in order to bring the message of Christ to the world and to mankind as man is now. But this is simply another way of saying that we are having difficulty acquiring the new style that's called for by the decrees of the Second Vatican Council. We are trying to keep faith with those decrees and trying to translate them into intelligible terms for the church and for society now. And this is one of the reasons that at the present time we have a, a new note of oftentimes acrimonious debate within the church. Extremely conservative positions being advanced with fervor and with heat and extremely progressive, uh, sometimes revolutionary opinions being advanced uh, at the other end of the spectrum. First of all, as far as change is concerned, there can be no change in the divine institution and constitution of the church. The church exists as it has been established by Christ, and it will always continue that way. It was founded on Peter and the apostles and upon their successors, and it will always continue throughout the ages in that form. Unfortunately, church authorities and lay persons alike are all too often uh, becoming unduly fearful when they face the challenge of the trauma which is upon us. They do not reflect enough on the reality that though crisis means danger, even more it means the providential creation of once-in-a-lifetime opportunities for creative Christians and creative Christianity to offer the church new dimensions of love and of service. There can be no change in the Apostles' Creed or in the Nicene Creed or in any of the creeds of the Catholic Church. There can be no change in the essentials of the Mass and of the seven sacraments. There can be no change in the Ten Commandments. There can be no change in the infallible dogmatic decrees of the ecumenical councils of the church. If renewal and reform fails in the church of the United States, it will not be enough for us to wring our hands and point fingers of shame at our leadership. On the other hand, we must make no mistake about it. Bishops and pastors in particular have an inescapable leadership role. Leadership is their office. It's their full-time function in the church. It is said, although it hasn't been historically proven, that Pope John opened the windows to let in fresh air into the Catholic Church. 
I say I can find a historical confirmation of this story, but if it is true, it is evident that when you open windows, you can let in not only fresh air, but you can let in some queer birds who will mess up everything inside. The times cry out to us today to stop this foolishness of playing church, the same as we used to play house or cowboys and Indians as children. We are adults in the church, and St. Paul warns us that we must put away the things of childhood and begin acting as adults. The concept of the people of God, all of us, together as pilgrims seeking our eternal rendezvous together in a community of believers. This concept has freed our imaginations and forced many of us for the first time to think creatively about our religion and our church as we have never done before. We are very much in need in the church right now of a greater degree of rapport between these two different forces, the very reactionary who are of a mind that any change is bad, and those at the other end of the spectrum who would say that any change is good, regardless of its substance. We are in need, really, of those voices who will bring these ends of the spectrum together so that we might keep faith with the tradition which we are obligated to keep. This is the fundamental substance of the teaching of Christ. I'm really not happy with the change because I was born and raised a very strict Catholic and, and was taught that it could not be changed. It was infallible, and I, I find this very hard to accept and to explain to my children. I would imagine no to people, so it's going too fast. But the church is going to have to redefine herself, uh, her very basis, from the concept of authority to legalism in the church and even to certain sacred doctrines that uh, apparently uh, many people continue to hold. That's right. It's very distracting, this new modern method they have for mass. I prefer the old Latin, like where you're raised in your childhood. And uh, it's more religious. You have to have moved fast this day and age. It just can't be slow like we used to be. I'm real happy with it. The decrees of the Second Vatican Council call us not only to a review of our style and our mode of addressing ourselves to the world, but also call us to create several new structures within the Catholic Church. One of the most promising of these experiments, and one that we're all looking to, because we need some pilot programs that blaze some trails. Uh, we need to have some success stories at this time, and one of them that we're watching with a great deal of interest is the experimental parish, or as it's called, the community of John the 23rd in Oklahoma City. Why did this all come about in Oklahoma? Probably the atmosphere of religious freedom here gave us the courage to think for ourselves. And a lot of people ask, what motivated you people in Oklahoma to start the community of John the 23rd? And there are lots of reasons, but probably I would say the most significant points Number one, our frustration with the slowness of renewal from a grassroots level at the close of Vatican II. Secondly, as Americans, we just felt the need to be involved in a community in which we were instrumental in shaping its destiny. In order to be sure that we weren't tied to the old traditional structures, we named ourselves the community of John the 23rd. We don't own any land or buildings. As a matter of fact, we rent a school hall for our Sunday morning meetings. We hire Father Naren to be our priest, our servant. We govern ourselves by means of an elected lay chairman and elected board of directors, of which I myself am, am a member. And we meet right here in this rented office. I think one thing that we should discuss is a question that uh, Bill talked to me about last week. He called me on the phone and was a little concerned about a couple of problems that we, he thinks we have. And would you mind kind of filling them in a little bit on what they are and we can talk about it? Uh, one of the things that, that is really bugging uh, the church is the role of the priest. So I have one particular vision of what it is as I experience it in this community. Of course, one of the things that really intrigues me uh, would be, could I handle uh, another John the 23rd or a third John the 23rd? And what this would do in my human relationships to the people here. I'm very happy uh, in my life as a priest because 
uh, after some 16 years of trying to figure out what Christianity is all about and what I'm all about in it, I think that in some way, some limited way, we've discovered something here. We're a searching group and I can help lead them to search and to come up with uh, things that uh, would really express their life, their ups and downs, their sins and their loves. Let's at this time uh, bring forth our prayers of petition. I'd like to pray for my grandfather's back to get better so I won't have to send him to the hospital. Yeah, I want to pray for our grandfather so his back will be better. Mel? I would like to petition God's blessings on my forthcoming marriage. She wants to ask you for. God's blessing on her forthcoming marriage, which is May the 30th, March. <laughs> Nobody, I'm sorry. <laughs> Freudian slip. <laughs> Almighty God, may you accept all of the petitions that you have heard from us this morning gathered around this banquet table. We ask you to remember all of our thoughts besides those uh, articulated. We ask you to be mindful of the groups that have been working this morning, trying to solve some of the problems in the world. We ask you to help our feeble... We first heard about uh, 30 families through an announcement at John the 23rd. I was just wondering uh, what ways a group could do to, uh, to foster some type of ordinance that might help uh, people... Uh, 30 families is a group that hopes to obtain approximately 30 families to move back into an area that is integrating, hoping to stop resegregation as it has happened in almost every place that a Negro has moved into. I have come to decide that you are not a Christian unless you act. That going to church on Sunday, uh, you know, you can go to church forever and not really be a Christian. Now, I feel this is where John 23rd played uh, an important part. Just the fact that there are Negroes in the area, and even a white person has problems. And so conscious of Christ and the Holy Spirit, we praise you, Father, by saying together, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are filled with your glory. Hosanna. Some of the rewards of, of this tutoring program are difficult to explain. That the voter has earmarked the 2% state sales tax. Sort of an understanding, finally, that I've learned that people are important. And it's only in dealing with a people, one person, that you really do any good in the world. But this is part of, I think, what John the 23rd is trying to say, that it's a person and another person respecting and loving each other. What do you think about it? The money they get from the federal government should be enough for the welfare department. When supper was ended, he took the cup into his hands and again giving thanks to his Father in heaven, he blessed it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take all of you and drink of this, for this is my blood the blood of a new covenant, a mystery of faith. This blood which will be shed for you... We teens at John the 23rd were kind of getting sick and tired of 
sitting back and watching the adults do all the work. So we decided that we were going to get our own group and go out and do something. Okay, now you kids know it. This is Kumbaya. You want to try it? And this is O, oh, and this is Lord. This is crying and shouting and praying. Okay? You want to start, sir? So one of our projects is to come down to Walnut Grove, which is a um, slum area, and we play with the kids. We've really never had this experience in other youth groups, but here uh, at John the 23rd, we can give of ourselves to the, the uh, members of the community and to, well, even these children here. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. Speak but the word, and my soul will be healed. Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. Speak but the word, and my soul will be healed. Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. Speak but the word, and my soul will be healed. Like the body of Christ. Pray the body of Christ. Amen. Call the body of Christ. Jeff, the body of Christ. All this you know, could not come about uh, if many other forces weren't operating within the church, and certainly one significant person in this whole picture is Bishop Reed, whom I think stands today unrecognized, as most prophets are unrecognized, in their own hometown. In some way, I think I love him. It's not surprising that Father Naren, who followed this subject very carefully, evolved certain ideas in regard to the formation of a parish structure that uh, would form a basis of experiment in some new mode of, of community. It's, it's well recognized that a bishop may exempt his people as a group from their uh, attendance at mass at a particular parish church, and all that is involved in this instance is that exemption, is that permission. And substantially, the church is the same now as always because her founder is the same and her mission to mankind is the same in every generation. But generations change, and as Pope John pointed out to the bishops in his address at the very beginning of the council, although the church remains the same, nevertheless the means that uh, the church uses in order to be effective in the life of man must be uh, constantly upgraded. The church has got to allow the people to have meaning in their lives. They are struggling for it, they're crying for it, and to keep it from them any longer is a sin. One of the questions which has come to the front for a great deal of discussion in the Catholic Church since the Vatican Council is the question of authority. Each year since I've been a bishop, I've been asked to conduct retreats for priests in one or two or three dioceses. And one of the things I do in these retreats is ask the priests to write on slips of paper topics that they would like to have discussed in a public open meeting. And in every one of these retreats that I've given, one of the questions that's very near the top of the list each time is the question of the proper relationship within the church to authorities. It is a big question. It's a cosmic question that cuts across many of the other questions in the church today. And I suppose the man who has uh, done the greatest amount of writing and research and is one of the most respected voices in the Catholic Church on this subject today is Father John McKenzie, the Jesuit scholar who is professor of theology at Notre Dame University. Catholics uh, in this country and in many other countries 
for the last hundred years or more have uh, lived fairly successfully in a democratic political society while they were members of a church with an absolute government. I am not sure that this generation and the next will be able to do this quite as successfully. What they want to do is to support the church, and they do not believe that support can be thought of simply as submission. They are more educated, they are more independent, and really they are more interested in what the church is and does. They feel they have more to give than mere submission. And if the church is impoverished, if that is all that is asked of them, we ought to realize that this desire to be more active members of the church is not a threat to church authority. It rather enlarges it. It gives church authority more with which to work, a greater field in which to exercise its leadership. It's very hard to generalize about the American hierarchy. One rather recent development, which I know bishops don't like, is that criticizing bishops seems to have become one of our major indoor and outdoor sports in the church. I think we ought to remember that our bishops themselves grew up in a certain church structure. Their education occurred within this church structure. Their previous experience has all occurred within this given church structure. It is precisely that which seems to be up for modification. And this development is wholesome. It's not a threat to church authority at all. It's not a danger. It should mean that the church will be more what it ought to be and more what it can be, both for its members and for the world at large. In the new church, bishops, religious superiors, and priests tend today to think of the virtue of obedience on the part of a priest, not only is that quality whereby he obeys orders and works cooperatively as a member of the parish or the diocese or the church, but also as the virtue which would incline a priest in proper fashion and with respect to express his own opinions to his bishop, to his diocesan senate, making recommendations for changes in procedures or techniques. In other words, stressing a twofold aspect of obedience, not just compliance, but obedience as compliance with decisions that have been made, but obedience which also inclines a respectful priest within the community of the diocese or the religious order to share his thoughts, his wisdom, his recommendations, his desires with his bishop. We'll rule in favor of freedom. We'll discuss it. Yeah. The chair recognizes microphone number three. Whereas the church's mission is to the whole world without regard to race, creed, color, or natural, na national origin, be it resolved that it is the mind of the ACP that service institutions of the Archdiocese of Chicago, for example, schools, hospitals, etc., be open to all without regard to race, creed, or color. Be it further resolved that those who do or who would like to avail themselves of these facilities not be forced to undergo, in undergo instructions in the Roman Catholic faith or be forced to attend Roman Catholic worship services as conditions to the use of these facilities. Many priests are reviewing their own identity and the role which they serve in the church and are finding uh, an unexpected kind of tension be between what I would call a tra an original tradition that put greater focus on just the prayer life and the life of piety of the individual priest than on service in the secular realm. In a ghetto, in the city, in a rural community in the country, in a very rapidly changing dynamic social situation. Let me say a few things here. First of all, I'm a man and also a priest. I'm concerned about injustice. It is my role as a priest to condemn injustices wherever I see it, and to preach the brotherhood of man, although I will not have any part of teaching brotherhood without justice, because to me this is sheer pietism, and it's a, 
really a horrible way of distorting the teachings of Jesus Christ. All I do is speak out of what I see. I live in the black community. I see children hungry every day. I see children being deprived of a good education. I see children uh, receiving improper medical attention. I see children going to bed every night, and I know there's a danger of them being bitten by rats. I see uh, uh, black people who are being deprived of their dignity as men because of the tremendous amount of discrimination in our society. I think that a, a certain amount of creative tension is needed in the Catholic Church as it is needed in the entire Christian community. Now you're asking, what do I think about the Catholic Church? To tell you the truth, I don't even think about it. I live in a, in a poverty situation where I look at the black poor every day. That man is the man that concerns me. He determines all of my actions. His sensitivities are the ones that I am concerned about. What happens in the church because I am concerned about the black poor doesn't bother me. If I am doing the work of Christ, whatever result that comes forth must be good. The new era of permissiveness, for example, or of freedom of discussion, which has not been characteristic, by and large, of the climate of opinion within the church in recent decades, has given rise to a whole new style of, of discussing openly and freely many questions which have not been discussed openly and freely in the past. One of them is the question of the celibacy of the priesthood. I'm Bob Duggan. So last November, I was a diocesan priest in New York, stationed in a parish in Westchester, and before that in a poverty area on the Lower East Side. I've also worked and studied in Rome uh, in the field of canon law. Last November, I resigned from the diocese. I'm now on leave of absence, and I'm working with the National Association for Pastoral Renewal, a group of mainly priests, but with many laymen, who have raised the discussion in the Catholic Church of clerical celibacy and seek to raise for public discussion many of the issues that were spoken of before in whispers, quietly, secretly, but which we feel should be spoken of in public so that there can be the wisdom of all of the members of the faith participating so that we can arrive at a deeper understanding of the role of priesthood, the role of marriage, of the role of the individual priest in his society as a person. The Catholic Directory for this year will indicate for the first time a decrease in the number of Catholic priests in the United States. Priests are leaving the ministry for many, many reasons, and clerical celibacy is a symptom of a much deeper problem of identity in the role of the priest in society today. We feel that the public discussion of these things will give us a greater understanding of the role of the priest, will give us a greater understanding of the meaning of Christian community, of the relationship that exists between the people and the priest and the whole life of the church as it moves into an entirely new age. Well, I'm for optional celibacy, uh, but as far as I'm concerned, I uh, enjoy very much what I'm doing. Uh, I think it's very important, and I could not see how I could possibly get married and do the kind of a job that I would want to do for my wife and children. Uh, that takes a lot of time, a lot of energy, and a lot of thoughtfulness. And right now I'm giving all my energy and thoughtfulness and time uh, to this uh, work in the church. And so uh, celibacy fits me perfectly. I think the opportunity should be made, you know, for the priest to um, marry if he so desires. The day may come when I'll accept it. <laughs> That's uh, about the best I can say. A year ago I would have just said horrors, and today, now, I, I probably will be able to accept it. I think the priest would lose respect, a lot of the respect that people have always given in the past. And I think that if priests began to get married, I think I would kind of even lose respect for them. They should be allowed to be married. I think that the... Uh, they can only, only give intelligent guidance to married couples and to people with questions about sex and marriage and that type of thing that they have to be married to have a qualified uh, answer. At the present time, on several levels in the church, there are reasonable doubts and questions about 
whether we should give our allegiance to some traditions of the past which have been required of us or to the new directions asked by the Second Vatican Council. The decree on the uh, religious life calls for a review by all of the religious orders of their constitution, their regulations, their bylaws, their, their code of life. They are being asked to engage in a democratic process seeking the counsel of all members of the community on whether or not this religious community is keeping faith today with its original purpose. The implementation of that decree is giving rise to new tensions within the church. For example, in Los Angeles, the Sisters of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Many people are curious to know how um, a chapter and its decisions come about. We were told in the instruction issued by Pope Paul VI in the fall of 1966 that each community was responsible for a special chapter of affairs. And we began as soon as the invitation was issued to announce to the community at large, to our 540 members, that we wanted to have our chapter of affairs in the summer of 1967. Almost immediately, we began to form commissions, study groups, which would begin to talk about the chief issues in religious life to issue questionnaires to the sisters, to conduct interviews, and in every way possible to do what Pope Paul VI had suggested, to renew the spirit and form of religious life. The Sisters of the Immaculate Heart uh, have been deeply interested in education ever since their foundation in 1848. And in their work in California, uh, they have been deeply involved in innovation and uh, new methods of education. One of the sisters who is most deeply involved in the renewal program and is a member of the special general chapter to which I referred is Sister Mary Carita Kent. Uh, she is certainly a most gifted artist, well known outside our own community, but she's also a most creative teacher and a beloved member of our community. Uh, I think that Sister Corita draws much of her inspiration from the community, and she herself is one of the first to admit this. Um, it's not just that she brings us her gifts, which she does most generously, but that our sister teachers have brought to her, and our sister companionship has brought to her, I think, a richness of personality, which she doesn't hesitate to attribute to the Immaculate Heart atmosphere. I think the, the part in the center section with the leaves um, has a kind of life to it. Uh, I feel terribly um, pseudo-Indian designs or something about the rest. Um, that is part of the life that you see at Immaculate Heart. It's a life which is that of a group of people um, who have the same goals and ideals, who want very much to serve people today, and who want to make themselves relevant. And of course, I suppose that leads us directly into the question of the habit. Those of us who have changed into contemporary clothing, I think would find it very difficult to return to the habit. And that's not because we didn't uh, reverence the habit when we wore it, when we received it, and that we haven't cherished it all these years. But somehow now, with the changing into contemporary clothing, the habit has become a symbol of a whole system of uniformity and conformity in which we no longer believe as we did before. Um, I personally would find it very difficult to return. Uh, we all wear a Christian symbol uh, which distinguishes us in some way, but we like very much the notion that we can become relevant to our society and really enter into our society and participate in it wholeheartedly without being in any way set apart. We have come to serve, not to be served. And so uh, we prefer to be dressed this way. The clothing before was a uh, kind of costume as we looked back on it, sometimes a medieval costume. And uh, we prefer to be thought of as women of a century that we are deeply interested in and to which we belong. We at Immaculate Heart feel that we should dedicate ourselves to those aspects of life to which the Christian mind and heart are drawn the burning issues of peace, poverty, race relations, the missions of healing, comforting, counseling, the challenge of expanding the imagination of man, and the joy of helping him to celebrate. 
Perhaps it is for us as dedicated women, free to invest our total energies, sharing our material goods with each other and the poor, to engage in, it, in a genuine search for an encounter with God. sisters, I think, for many years, especially sisters who have been in the convent for a decade or two, have begun to think, actually, that they could be better sisters if they were out of the convent. And many sisters who have left the convent have left not because they did not want to be sisters, but because they did want to be sisters. And they thought they could be better sisters outside the structure. And often I think sisters feel that there is not sufficient freedom to make a choice in religious life about how they will serve or even about their own person. How I as a unique individual need to serve according to my temperament, which is after all one of God's first gifts to me. And it is because that they do want to be sisters that many, many have formed into small groups still working in a dedicated, celibate, community life so that they can give a total and unique Christian dedication to the world. Before we've had the fallacy that the only way to be a sister was to be one in a giant institution where you found often that instead of serving the world, which was your ideal when you entered, you were serving the system. We call groups of people who live under the same rule a community. Community means a kind of a sharing of one's personhood, one's talents, and the way one stands in front of God. And this cannot be done with uh, several hundred or several thousand other women. It can be done only in a small group where you really share a life. This has resulted in the formation of many small groups most of them without much publicity at all, just very quiet, small groups. This is from uh, Paul's letter to the Romans. He says, Don't cherish exaggerated ideas of yourself or your importance, but try to have a sane estimate of your capabilities by the light of the faith that God has given to you all. Through the grace of God, we have different gifts. If our gift is preaching, let us preach to the limit of our vision. If it is serving others, let us concentrate on our service. If it is teaching, let us give all we have to our teaching. And if our gift be the stimulating of the faith of others, let us set ourselves to it. We do know that other people do want to join this group, and it will be uh, essential for us to keep the group small. So when other members are, are you know, belonging to it, then probably we will break down again into other smaller uh, groups so that we can keep these two things very authentic and very non-rigid, very unstructured, and, and we hope uh, that way also most Christian. Dear God, please um, help us to, to avoid selfishness in any decisions we make, especially decisions that concern people outside our group, and um, help us to do what um, Paul advises us in uh, the epistle to, um, 
to really serve without stint and to um, be genuine in our uh, charity. No. We ask this through Christ your Son. Well, in regard to the sisters, I feel that they are, by and large, going through a period of considerable tension, and uh, that many of the sisters who leave the recognized religious groups still wish to devote themselves or dedicate themselves to the work of the church. I feel if there's anything the church needs, uh, it is dedication. You see, on the part of the church, uh, uh, religion can't very well get along without dedication on the part of people, on the part of groups, on the part of individuals. And uh, I feel that as long as the persons involved are persons of good reputation and their expressed intentions are good, those in authority should permit them, again, to experiment and perhaps find a new and better way in which to serve the Lord than that to which they have been accustomed and in which they have found some personal difficulties. You were talking about the difference between just being in the school with a lot of white kids and accepted so in the classroom. They have this kind of deal down in Tulsa, mm -hmm. you know, between Booker T. Washington and the uh, all-white school down mm -hmm. there. Hall and, and Hall, wasn't it? Yes, and, uh, and, uh, and the paper said the white kids walked away and they said, I finally realized Negro just like me, uh -huh. you know? We call ourselves Sisters for Christian Service. And it's been interesting to us that many other communities have formed have used the words service and community in their titles. Those are the two key words to describe the framework for the new religious communities of this sort that we are trying to make. Because many sisters feel like they have not given service or have not been enabled to give service that's valid or really is needed most desperately or is most honest in terms of their own temperament. In this way, they can choose their own service. There is no one to say, you fill this slot. They simply see the need and then determine what they can do to uh, fulfill that need. In our current efforts for review and renewal in the Catholic Church, we have, of course, the great advantage of having many other friends who, although not members of the church, are very reliable observers and wise persons to counsel us in this period of renewal. One of them is a very distinguished scholar at Perkins School of Divinity at Southern Methodist University in Texas, Dr. Albert C. Outler, who attended every session of the four years at the Vatican Council. And I think he's one of God's great men. As we try to look ahead toward the future, uh, it is best to remember that uh, these are bad times for prognosticators. Uh, in uh, any case, uh, it seems reasonably certain that uh, there are difficulties uh, in the days ahead uh, in the Catholic Church uh, and in Christendom uh, in general. And yet, I see the future uh, as a more hopeful um, prospect uh, than some of my... Uh, uh, fellow Protestants or some of my Catholic friends because it seems to me that now the Roman Catholic Church has opened its heart and its arms and its mind uh, to the world, to the new spirit of uh, freedom um, and um, uh, liberty in the world. It means that the church is going to make it or fail uh, in the spirit uh, of freedom, persuasion, love, brotherhood. Oh,